All right, everyone, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I just wanted to say hello. My name is Alessandro Figueroa, and I'm a junior research associate in UNC Chapel Hill's Highway Safety Research Center. I'm happy to welcome all of our participants and panelists to today's installment of our PBIC webinar series. Today's webinar will feature part two of our e-scooter and micromobility safety webinar series. In today's webinar, we will highlight three agency level case studies from all around the country. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our panelists. Um, first, we're going to have Brian Wynn. Um, he is a shared micromobility coordinator at the Portland Bureau of Transportation. He currently leads station planning for Bike Town and is also responsible for the day to day operations of the city's e scooter program. Brian is a 2019 graduate of Portland State University's Master of Urban and Regional Planning program with a strong interest in transportation and food systems. Next, we'll have Ted Randell, um, and he is originally from Buffalo, New York. Ted moved to Washington, D.C. in 2019, where he received his master's in urban and regional planning at Georgetown. Ted oversees the district's shared fleet de er, device program, which currently permits over 17,000 dockless bikes and scooters. DDOT's sustainable transportation branch supports mode shift efforts and VMT reduction through various TDM strategies, robust bike and scooter share programs, and bike infrastructure planning, review, and installation. Lastly, we'll have Nathan Pope. He is a planner with the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, um, where he works on transit corridor planning with the City of Denver. Additionally, he works on transportation demand management efforts and the shared micromobility program. His focus is on projects that mac maximize mode shift and give uh, Denverites great transportation options. Just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Attendees, you are in listen-only mode, but you can still communicate with us using the Q&A pane at the bottom of the Zoom webinars window. We've built in some time at the end of today's webinar for a discussion period with our panelists, so we'll try to integrate your questions and comments. Please submit them at any time. Part one of this webinar series highlighted FHWA's shift to an equity approach in its micromobility efforts. This group provided a thoughtful discussion on the evolving nature of the micromobility space and how to incorporate improvements that serve all people of all abilities. Additionally, we had a team from the Behavioral Traffic Safety Cooperative Research Program present the BTS-10 project, which created a toolkit outlining their identified e-scooter safety problems and associated solutions. To view part one and other PBIC webinars, they can be found in our webinar archive at www.pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars. That includes a copy of today's slides and a video recording, which should be available by tomorrow. We are currently in the process of uploading today's slides, so there might be some delay in it, but it should be up by the end of the webinar. Um, this webinar is eligible for certain certificates and professional development hours, we will be providing everyone with a link to download a certificate of attendance following completion of the post webinar questionnaire. A follow up email will contain more details about all of this, so please be on the lookout for that in your inbox. As always, we encourage you to check out our recorded webinars and sign up for future episodes. That being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Brian Wynn with the City of Portland um, and welcome him to share out his slides. Thanks, Andrew, for the introduction, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you all see this, Sandro? Can you? Are we good, Sandro? Yep, we are all good to go. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, as Sandra mentioned, I'm the day-to-day -day program manager for um, e-scooters in the Portland Bureau of Transportation. So um, I'll start off with sharing the, this is the agenda, the history of shared micromobility in Portland, as well as our equity program, and then talk about recent milestones and transition to talking about our long-term scooter program and finish off with talking about data and parking. So the share bike mobility has been around since 2016 in Portland with the launch of Bike Share, our Bike Town program uh, 1.0. And then we started having scooters in summer of 2018. 
that was our first pilot for th four months. And then we came back, did the findings report and released uh, a permit phase for phase two in April of 2019. Um, and that's been going on since till now where we've had our RFP process and city council approved our program in October of 2020 to transition to a long-term scooter program. And at the end of last year, through our RFP process, Lyft and Lime were chosen as our operating partners for our long-term scooter program, hopefully to be launched um, sometime this spring. Sure, so this is a graph of all the share back mobility trips um, in Portland since 2016. Um, scooter ridership definitely outweighs bike town ridership, um, but shared bike mobility has recovered post pandemic in tw since 2020 and continued to rise every year since then. Uh, so some basics of our scooter program um, in 2023, um, during the pilot program, pilot period, uh, we had Bird, Lime, and Spin as our operators. Um, and Bird pulled out of the market um, after our RFP process and our decision to go with Lime and Lyft in October. And then um, with Spin, they pulled their fleet at the end of last year as well. Um, as you may or may not know, Bird filed for bankruptcy and the scooter market has changed a lot in the last six months. So currently Lime is our only operator Lyft will we will bring on and transition Lyft um, in the next few months. Uh, as for um, ridership and numbers in 2023, um, we had over 1.1 million trips in scooter trips in 20 last year. Uh, the service area for scooters is citywide, so 145 square miles. Uh, we we regulate we permitted scooters to 3,400 scooters in our fleet size. Uh, that was between three operators. Uh, we'll, we'll increase the fleet by a little bit um, in our long-term scooter program. And since the scooter program began, we've had over 5 million trips. Um, switching to equity programs, uh, for during the, this pilot period, the last few years, we've kind of left um, outreach and equity outreach to the scooter companies themselves and not have dedicated staff here at Peabot do the outreach. We do require an equity program, so a low discounted program for trips, for rides and trips. Um, companies do distribute helmets in the community. Um, they've developed partnerships with community-based organizations. And then with our recent RFP in the equipment and demonstration phase, uh, we really honed in on how to equitably or how to objectively score equity issues and like during our demonstration. So looking at, we broke it down into three buckets. So one was the financial piece, the financial access piece, whether you were um, unbanked and could sign up for the program and like looking at the technological uh, process would be signing up without a smartphone. Um, and then the enrollment barriers, just looking at how fast do you get approved for um, when signing up for an equity program. So that's what we really focused in on our equitable access issues um, with our long-term program. And then some recent milestones we've had in the last year, uh, we were the first program in the city to transition to Portland 301 for customer service issues. So any parking, uh, issue slash uh, sidewalk safety. Uh, you could fill out a form online and submit the ticket. It would go to the companies themselves um, to resolve in a timely fashion. We also launched the micro mobility dashboard with Ride Report um, for more data transparency with the public and researchers. And that allowed uh, just more research to be conducted uh, as well. And we all, and finally we designed and reviewed it, got approval for e-scooter e pavement marking to be installed in our future bike corrals 
as we transition to a lock two system with a long term program. In terms of geofencing and safety, as I said about the 311 form, we had some concerns from our operators about parking issues, uh, whether residents or constituents would report things that were properly parked for to our rules and standards, but to the public, it seemed like it was improperly parked. So we're in the process of updating our pictures, uh, up, updating our form with pictures to limit like the operational costs of the scooter companies going out to uh, visibly verify that this was a properly parked scooter. Uh, sidewalk riding is still a concern for us, but we, we have to think about it in terms of equity issues where sometimes in our equity priority areas, there's a lack of infrastructure, uh, of bicycle uh, protected infrastructure, and it kind of has to resort to the scooter rider having to use the sidewalk instead of the street. Um, as far as slow ride zones are concerned, we have limited slow ride zones and no parking zones. Um, usually that's usually around our arenas or big event areas. We try not to have no parking zones and slow ride zones because it affects the user experience as well, the scooter riders experience. Um, and we do require companies to have in-app quiz in quizzes um, in multiple languages to help educate users about rules of the road and for new users, you're limited, you require companies to limit their speeds for the first few rides. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that we're doing lock two with our new long-term program that we're having launching a safety campaign um, for lock two um, incorporate advertisements along transit routes, like along the high ridership transit routes, as well as in our equity priority areas where the we see a lot of scooter ridership in East Portland, which is our high equity area. So this was a timeline, this is a basic timeline of how we've transitioned from our pilot program to our long-term scooter program. And as I mentioned earlier, 2018 was our first scooter pilot. And then 2020 was when the council approved us to transition to a long-term program. Uh, we've had multiple iterations with our RFP um, due to city procurement issues, as well as protests from the companies. I could elaborate, but I'll spare you the details. And um, we are hoping to launch um, the new program this spring. Uh, so the structuring of our long-term program uh, the changes will be the lock two requirement to reduce pedestrian conflicts. We'll have fewer operators to improve the user experience. And looking at more scooters, increasing the fleet to 3,500 total scooters across the city, as well as different form factors to increase transportation access. Uh, we're also looking at different uh, hiring practices, as well as promoting equitable hiring practices by requiring companies and their subcontractors to be W-2 employees. And we're really thinking about the cost of a trip for a scooter user and um, how much it affects the, um, the, the cost of the trip is so high for scooter users and we're trying to limit and reduce the cost for the equitable or most vulnerable users. Um, we had Lime had their Lime app Lime Access Program, which is the equity program for um, for their their company, and we saw a no, they were offering originally last year, for the first six months, five free, thirty minute rides a day, and then they changed that program in the middle of the year to fifty cents to unlock to and seven cents a minute, and it really impacted the number of users. Um, enrolled in that program month to month. Uh, we saw a drastic difference in ridership between equitable users. So the cost of a trip is really important for equity programs. And um, our program is budget neutral. We generate fees um, 
but we generate re revenue through fee the fees that the companies pay us. Uh, with Lock2, we've thought about installing more parking. Um, this is all the bike racks in the city of Portland. Um, the red circle there indicates our East Portland geography, and there's a limited number of bike racks, and that's what we're looking to change um, in the next couple of years. So with uh, parking, currently we have a dockless system uh, with a 15% fleet requirement in our equity zones, which are based on this graphic at the top here, it's zones four, three, four, nine. Um, and for the future of our program, we're switching to lock two and these neighborhood coverage zones. So we've basically sliced up the city in 10 geographic areas and required, um, based on census tract data, two scooters per thousand residents. And that's determines the minimum number of scooters that should be deployed in each coverage zone per day to allow access, further access for users. Um, and with, with that, we've also incorporated a downtown deployment cap uh, of, I believe, 40% of a company's fleet is maximum allowed in the downtown area to provide more equitable distribution of the scooters themselves. And with installing more bike racks in the, the, the map I showed you pre in the previous slide, our goal is in installing 375 more bike staples in the next couple of years. Um, we've also have the new pavement marking, as you can see on the lower left here, um, that will be installed in our bike corrals. And so there will be a bike person symbol as well as a scooter person symbol to indicate parking for both devices. And we, we're using data from ride report, um, such as deployments, trip starts, trip ends, to determine where to install these bike racks. Um, um, in addition to focusing on East Portland, uh, we want to know where, where we have the capability to see where operators are deploying their scooters as well. So we want to accommodate them as well. And then the last part is working with our pedestrian coordinator. I, we have a tool, a map that has um, identified intersections that need daylighting. So we feel that we can install bike racks in sections that, to help daylight intersections um, where there's already no parking installed in the city um, as an infrastructure win. And I think this is my last slide. Uh, so the next steps for the scooter program is we're in the middle of contract negotiations with Lime and Lyft right now, and we're hoping to deliver greatest public benefit, but also continue the, the trip growth in Portland um, and installing more bike racks in the next couple of years. And we're hoping to launch by this spring. With that, that is the end of my presentation. And I'll turn it back to Sandra. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brian, for highlighting the valuable work going on in Portland. I think now we'll go ahead and turn it over to Ted with DDOT. Um, if you just want to go ahead and share out your slides, you have the floor. Perfect. Thank you, Sandro. And thank you to PBIC and all the collaborators uh, for having me. Um, I think it's it's helpful to start by, you know, just saying that this is a great uh, example of um, what I really find valuable uh, and rewarding about the shared micromobility industry is the, the level of collaboration um, between practitioners, researchers, uh, and operators. Um, you know, it's really become a, a collaborative effort to, to shape policies that work uh, best for cities. And I've worked uh, with Brian and Nathan both separately on several occasions, um, you know, just sharing information, sharing data, um, sharing best practices that, that have worked or, or haven't worked. Um, so this is this is a common um, you know conversation. So it's exciting to have uh, have an audience this time, um, and it's not often that you know we get a new transportation mode to sort of craft a, uh, you know solutions for. So this is really an exciting um, industry to be a part of. And shared mobility, I think, has solved or addressed a lot of um, you know 
issues related to urban transportation networks, inefficiency, congestion, pollution, cost, et cetera. But, you know, just like any um, transportation option, it's going to come with its downsides, its, its externalities. So, um, you know, as, as, a, as a practitioner in this industry, you know, we're, we're very much at that sort of crossroads of always trying to, you know, promote and, and be activists for, you know, safe um, infrastructure and, and good practices, um, while, you know, also recognizing that there are a lot of downsides to this that we need to, to, to approach and we need to be nudging a certain behavior or retaining affordability um, and ensuring safety. So um, just with that, um, I'll give a little bit of background on, on um, DDOT as uh, what we call ourselves. Um, we are the District of Columbia's transportation uh, planning um, and we, we own all of the, the right of way. We maintain um, all of the roads and sidewalks in the district. Um, anything that's not federally owned uh, falls under our jurisdiction. Um, our mission is to deliver an equitable, safe, sustainable, and reliable multimodal transportation network for all residents and visitors of the District of Columbia. Um, as you can see, my uh, I am sort of housed within the, trans the Sustainable Transportation Programs branch. Um, so we have the Transportation Demand Management Program that you know helps people transition um, out of single occupancy vehicles into more sustainable modes of transportation. Um, we also house our capital bike share program, which I'll touch on briefly. Um, our freight program as well is, is housed um, for the time being, we're actually going through reorg, which if you're familiar with uh, government is, is all too common. But um, to give a little bit of, of background and context and, and give you a distinction between the, the two programs that, this, that my team um, manages, Capital Bike Share has been around since uh, 2010. It was uh, technically predated by uh, Smart Bike uh, in 2008. So it's the oldest of its kind in the United States. Um, when it first was launched, it had like somewhere around 200 bikes and a couple stations. Uh, we now are up to um, 700 plus stations and um, about 6,000 bikes over seven, seven member jurisdictions across the region. So um, we work with uh, Motivate, which is owned by Lyft, um, to um, to manage the um, the day to day operations. But uh, the key distinction with this program is that it is publicly owned and managed. So all of the revenue that we are generating um, is coming back to the district um, and being used to improve the system, to expand the system, to help plan new stations, um, and to market the the system as well, and to um, provide. Um, really a, a truly affordable um, transportation alternative uh, for folks in the district. It's one of the one of the cheaper bike share systems in the country. So with that sort of background knowledge, I'll move over to the shared fleet device program, which is what I'm mostly responsible for managing. Um, and the key distinction here is that these are all private operators. These um, are, are two year permit cycles that are authorized by uh, by the district council um, and legislated um, through uh, our district regulations. Um, which DDOT helps sort of standardize and, and set those um, on an ongoing basis. Um, we sort of set the vision for the program every couple of years um, through the rulemaking process. The system is currently a hybrid. Um, we have bikes and scooters, um, but they are all dockless. Um, just like Portland, we also have a lock two requirement that was instituted in 2021. Happy to say more about that if there are questions there. Um, the funds that are generated by this program go back to the general fund. So this is a little bit different than capital bike share. These, this is not a program where, you know, we're really looking to use these funds to pump back into infrastructure. We have sort of separate funds for, you know, bike racks and there's a whole different and whole nother team that, that works on bike lanes and, and infrastructure. But um, just wanted to give a little bit of background to, I think that that can be a, a key um, distinction here. And we're, we're currently permitted uh, we have four four permitted operators: Lime, Lyft, Spin, and Vio. Um, so combined, I think it's seven permits for e-bikes and scooters. So it's a very large fleet. And as I mentioned, you know, DDOT, our role basically is setting the vision for the program. We're less involved in the day-to-day -day operations and maintenance of devices and of the system itself. Um, you know, the apps, the technology, and stuff. But we do sort of um, go out and and look at best practices around the country. Um, we're looking at how to improve the program um, from a policy standpoint um, to make the program affordable for folks. Um, and we do a lot of data analysis as well. Um, that's been one of the really um, positive things that's come out of um, this industry is, is lots and lots of data. 
Um, and we have, you know, third party aggregators that we work with to um, provide dashboards of this data, make it really easy to access um, and see for both the public and for internal um, use and our partners, the operating partners have been really helpful in that and they're, they're always eager to support um, transportation uh, data projects and it, it helps us better understand the system and how things are running. Um, so just to, to give you a quick snapshot and a quick sort of scope of the program, um, and I don't like to say this too often because, um, at least internally, because I don't like to ruffle feathers, but um, if you combine both of our agencies' transit uh, programs, which the DC Circulator and the DC Streetcar, um, those trips combined don't even scratch the surface of shared fleet device trips. Um, in 2023, we had 6.7 million trips, um, which is not including capital bike share, which accounted for an additional 4.5 million trips. So, um, you know, tr not, not to toot my own horn here, but you know, this, this is a pretty, um, these are staggering numbers, you know, when we think about the fact that this program didn't exist a couple years ago, and also the fact that, you know, there's a, um, the, there's no budget line in, in the DC budget for this program, you know, it's basically, you know, self-functioning, um, so just, and then with that uh, in mind, you know, we're also, um, we, we saw 7% of our trips in 2023 come from low income customers. The average trip distance is about a mile. It's a little bit longer for bikes, which is interesting. Um, and we are starting to learn more about like why people choose bikes versus scooters, which I think is an interesting approach. I know that this presentation is really sort of more scooter focused, but just want to throw out the, the fact that, you know, we're, we're also really, really um, bike focused as well. Um, on our, on our team. Um, and as I mentioned, um, you know, we're somewhere near 17,000 devices combined. Um, this is more of a, um, just another sort of snapshot of how the device totals have changed over the years. As you can see, last year we increased the number of scooters and we saw a doubling of the bike trips. But um, really what's impressive about this is the, the sort of um, consistency that the industry has been able to build. Um, and it's really bounced back quite well from the pandemic. Um, we saw, you know, obviously a huge um, downward trend during the pandemic, but people actually did sort of um, turn to shared micromobility as a safer option um, during the pandemic when, when transportation, uh, when transit, um, you know, people didn't want to cram into, into the metro cars and, and buses. So, um, but I, I, I want to um, be able to spend enough time here on, on safety challenges and safety issues in, in the district, um, which uh, we are a vision zero city. And um, you may have heard the Swiss cheese model of transportation networks, um, which is why um, this slide looks the way it does. Um, the idea is that, you know, um, at, when a transportation system is designed so that all road users are protected to various degrees, um, when one safety protection fails, or if it does fail, then another um, can step in to prevent uh, serious injury or fatality. This is often a product of um, investment in the built environment, but it does include education and safety-based policy as well. Um, so for shared micromobility, this means that um, in following Vision Zero and safe system initiatives, um, you, know, you have to include proper um, micromobility infrastructure, which means separate paths and charging facilities, parking facilities, um, measures to calm uh, motor vehicle traffic, like reducing speed limits, narrowing lanes, raising intersections, et cetera, um, and then doing um, good post-crash care in the case of an injury, in, uh, in the case of an injury, which requires a lot of um, it's often interagency coordination between um, police department, DOT, DMV, things like that. Um, so all those things help to, to sort of accommodate a, a multimodal transportation system. And we're very fortunate in DC to have a very large bike community and a supportive administration and council that recognize this need for, for separate safe facilities for roadway users. Um, and we're expanding our bike network every year. This graphic gives you a sense of the pace and breadth of the network just since 2020. Um, but even in a city like Washington, DC, with a lot of things going our way, this still takes a lot of money and political will, um, which I will, you know, let others take credit for again. But um, we have a long way to go. Um, but you know, I think this is sort of the most obvious and direct Vision Zero um, approach that that cities can take. But um, you know, as I mentioned, the education piece um, is vital, um, and I think a challenge for any city with a competitive um, shared scooter market um, where there are private operators competing for rides is going to be consistency and streamline education platforms and messaging. So we really do rely heavily on 
our operators to do education for their own users. It's a big part of how they secure permits um, and they have the means to do so, the technology and the apps and then the social media following to do so. Whereas, you know, um, your, your typical uh, citizen doesn't necessarily follow all of their, you know, um, just of their agencies on social media. Um, so often the, the challenge can be, um, you know, creating, um, creating a, a common material or language uh, or a way to educate um, the public through websites, through engagement, um, so that there is a trusted source. Because you know we are a bridge to the community, um, and you know it, it can be often easier said than done with administrative constraints um, and the limits of any government agency. Um, but uh, so that's that's sort of why we do turn turn heavily to our shared micro mobility operators to to take on a lot of the education burden themselves and they are required to submit educational um, plans and then follow up on a monthly basis on how many of those um, uh, you know, education classes were delivered, how many helmets were handed out, those sort of things that um, you know, we're, we're able to check boxes and make sure that you know, they're, they're being active uh, community partners and furthering education. Um, so what is, it, what is DC up to? Um, in 2023, like I mentioned, we decreased um, from five to four operators um, through, our, through our permit application process. Um, we added more bikes to our shared fleet device program um, and we're expanding bike lanes. Um, we raised our lock to audit rate. So what this means um, is previously we were requiring that 20% of all trips be audited by the company. So you take a picture at the end of your ride to prove that you locked your uh, vehicle to something and then it's out of the way of pedestrians. So operators are required to um, review a certain percentage of these trips so that they can give fines to customers. Um, and um, I can get into, you know, how, how that's looked over the past uh, year or two. Um, but um, we've also increased the low-income customer, or sorry, we saw a lot of success with the low-income customer incentive that we launched as well this year. So what this is, is we give a, a discount basically to operators if, if uh, a certain threshold of trips are taken by low-income customers, um, because we have certain requirements around um, the type of program that needs to be set up. And this was a way to incentivize them to actually do the, the legwork of recruiting folks. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we saw about 7% of, of rides taken by low-income customers, which, which we're very happy about. Always looking to improve on that. Um, and then for 2024 and beyond, um, DC currently is the only city where uh, that I am aware of that has a 10 mile per hour uh, speed limit. So we're looking to increase that. Um, studies are, have shown that um, a slower uh, speed encourages sidewalk riding. Um, we have a lot of sidewalk riding issues in the district. Um, so in conjunction with a speed limit increase, um, we're requiring our operators to have some sort of sidewalk detection technology. It's a technology that's been in the industry for a while. You know, we've demoed it a bunch of times and we've heard a lot from operators. Um, we're ready to do this, um, you know, when you are, when you tell us to. So <laughs> that's what we're doing uh, or hoping to do. Um, we're also reviewing our approach to parking incentives, parking density and typology. So looking at how folks park, where they park and what, um, incentives they need to choose one location over another. Um, we are updating our application questions, which we do you know, every time we have a new uh, permit cycle coming up. Um, but we are looking at ways that we could maybe um, change the permitting structure in the future. A lot of cities um, are turning towards longer term contracts um, with fewer operators. Um, it gives above all, I think, uh, an opportunity for, for the operator to really invest in the city because they know they have, they have sort of um, not guaranteed, but you know, a, a much more, um, uh, they have some insurance that they're going to be there for a longer period of time. Um, other, other things that we're thinking about are, are adding more types of devices, um, potentially doing some sort of hybrid docking system, um, continuing to install corrals and bike racks. We have uh, one team member, that's all he does is goes out and, and installs um, additional bike racks. It was part of um, council's requirement when they established the lock two requirement for devices that we install at least a thousand bike racks per year. Um, we've kept that pace up thanks to Javier. So um, it's a great model. Um, it again does require, you know, money. So um, it, it, it might not be um, plausible for every city, but that's just how we do it. Um, and again, we're growing our protected bike lane network. So looking at some of the challenges of safety, um, you know, I think I, I kind of wanted to highlight some of the 
um, the less obvious things that that a, a program administrator like myself deals with on a regular basis. Um, you know, it's part of the um, challenge that that was mentioned in the, in the previous webinar was was based around underreporting, um, either from riders um, or um, misreporting from um, police departments. I know we had a question in the chat um, that that was in regards to this, um, but this is really just a challenge from from a lot of um, perspectives. You know, if you're involved in a scooter crash, you you may have um, you may not want to you know report it yourself because you have there's a fear that you know you're going to have to pay for damages. Um, Oftentimes you just don't know that reporting is something that should be done. Um, and when the police do arrive on the scene, oftentimes the reporting is, is um, somewhat disjointed. Um, we often see scooters are reported um, in crash reports, but it actually turned out to be, you know, a Vespa style uh, motor scooter. Even we've even seen power wheelchairs be classified as scooters, dirt bikes, um, and then you know, sort of on the other side of things, sometimes scooters are, are categorized as pedestrians. Um, so just the, from a sheer data perspective, that creates a lot of challenges um, administratively. Um, and then there's really not a whole lot of um, police priority as far as uh, enforcement. Um, we would love to have, you know, people, my, myself or others um, out in the field, but, you know, we have a very limited staff. So, you know, just the ability to be out there enforcing laws ourselves is something that's, that's often a challenge. Um, and then inconsistencies with, with the reporting that we receive from vendors around crashes, around safety. Um, you know, we do receive sort of monthly reports that detail um, crashes or um, instances um, where customer service had to step in for, for some reason. And, um, one common theme is when you have that sort of competitive, there are four different operators in the district, everybody does something slightly different. Um, that just creates sort of a time, a time drain um, on any, any sort of manager of a program like this. Um, we also don't have, currently we don't have the ability to find vendors or users directly. Um, and um, that just leads to, you know, if, if you are going out and doing enforcement, what's it for um, is sort of a big question um, that we have. Um, but um, so going into some uh, brief um, sort of takeaways from, from some data that we've seen uh, recently, um, one of the big things that I, I, I keep seeing and, and keeps being highlighted for me is that um, college age, younger adults are being uh, injured at a much higher rate. Um, there is certainly an impact um, a tourist impact, especially in Washington, D.C. Um, the study that this that this chart shows was actually done in, in Chicago. So I'd imagine the, the rate of tourists um, is probably higher in a city like D.C. Um, but something that is maybe, maybe a silver lining <laughs> is that um, scooter riders are more likely to hurt themselves. Um, and we often see scooter riders being injured on their very first trip, especially when the program and when scooters first launched, um, you know, back in like 2016, 2017, there was a lot of, um, there was a lack of education and there was a lack of comfortability. These might be folks, these might be a different profile of people than your typical cyclist. Um, you know, somebody who's riding a scooter may feel more comfortable on that and isn't used to, you know, riding in the street, riding with traffic. Um, we also see a lot of head injuries, you know, helmet use is really low. Um, and this is sort of one of those sort of challenges with, with a program, um, you know, where, where we're, we're providing a lot of convenience, but that convenience has, has a big cost. You know, you step out of a, your house, you don't necessarily know you're going to be getting on a scooter. You know, you're walking to the grocery store and you realize you're going to be late. You hop on a scooter, you're not going to have a helmet with you um, unless you really planned that. So that's another big challenge with helmet use. Um, but I guess another sort of takeaway is that, um, you know, um, in this in this study, at least, and this was DC um, a few years back, um, but there was actually a fairly low number of injuries that resulted in hospitalization. So a lot of the time, these are minor um, bruises and scrapes, but um, you know we do need to recognize that there's a serious safety concern, especially around head injuries, which can be very damaging. So what can we do about safety? What are some of the things that we um, that we have in our in our toolbox. Um, we have lots of data, as I mentioned. You know, we're receiving data from operators on trips, um, trip counts, device number of devices, 
where trips are occurring. So this is something that we can overlie with other transportation data to look at the network at large, see where trips are happening, make sure that we have the infrastructure in these places to support these, these sort of trips. So um, separate bike lanes and the like. We receive monthly data. So an example of month, the, the sort of data that we receive um, is down there at the bottom right. Um, so this would be something um, that, that the operators would report to us. Um, that details the sort of number of, uh, of injuries um, or other occurrences that, that took place over the past month. So we can look to those numbers. Um, we have the photo audits that I mentioned. We, have, we can leverage education plans, campaigns, um, and social media of um, the operators themselves. We have police crash, crash reports. We have a whole Vision Zero office here that does a lot of the data um, and legwork to, to streamline all of that information into a dashboard. That's a very helpful tool for us. Um, improved safety aboard these devices. So the, the sidewalk detection that I mentioned, um, there's potentially a um, technology that will be able to tell if there are um, two or more riders on a single device at one time. We have a 311 porting system, much like Portland. Um, and ultimately we have authority and discretion over permit renewal, which is a very powerful tool. Um, future regulations can also help shape the um, safety uh, landscape um, and obviously expanding uh, infrastructure, which is which is a common theme that I've mentioned today. So some things that that we can really do to to move this forward is is better crash reporting. Um, you know, get everybody on the same page when it comes to reporting different types of devices. Um, look at how police are categorizing these things and give them you know clear resources to to better um, to better report them. Um, really push forward that tech. You know, as cities, we can we can move the needle when it comes to these things by you know including them in our regulations so that operators are required to to really push the envelope when it comes to technology. Um, looking at the type of permit and permit um, renewal process, um, different public resources that we can publish and then agencies can own based on data, based on um, resident input, those sort of things. Um, and I think that's about all the time I have. So um, if you have any Questions, I think we'll save those for later, but um, my information is here. Um, we'll be available in the slides. Stop sharing. Perfect, thank you so much, Ted. Um, and then lastly, we'll jump over to Nathan Pope with the city of Denver and uh, go ahead and share those slides when you are ready. Great, well, thanks, Ted. Thanks, uh, Brian. Thanks so much for having us here at this webinar today. I'm super excited to share what's going on in Denver. Um, I believe I'm sharing my screen right, but give me a holler if it's not working. And then let me just get my windows situated. We are all good to go. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, um, my name is Nathan. Uh, I'm with the City and County of Denver in the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure um, and help do uh, some of our shared bike and scooter work and excited to talk to you all today about the program and safety in particular. Um, just like the other two, I'm gonna start with just kind of an overview of our program. Um, it's been, been around for five or so years now, so it's a little, it's pretty established. Um, E-bikes and e-scooters, all dockless here in Denver. So um, we used to have a B-cycle dock system that we no longer do, and we are strictly a dockless system now. Um, there was some chat, there was some conversation in the chat and the Q&A about uh, weather, and that is definitely something that we see here um, in Denver where it can be a, a 60 degrees, day like it was yesterday or a blizzard like it's going to be tomorrow um, and that'll impact ridership but we always done we always see folks um, continuing to take advantage of these mobility options on all but the the worst uh, weather days um, mm -hmm. average trip distance is around uh, you know a little under a mile and average trip speed is about seven miles per hour um, we have license agreements with two operators uh, Lyft and Lime um, they both provide scooters and bikes, and we require um, in those license agreements that at least 20% of their fleets have to be e-bikes. The operators definitely prefer scooters. They're easier to deploy. They're easier to maintain, but um, we really want to make sure that we have uh, those options for folks. So 20% um, must be e-bikes. Um, the operators are also um, in charge for or, or in are tasked with building out our corrals, helping us build out our parking corrals, which I'll talk, touch more on. Equity programs are in the next slide, and um, we also have a requirement where they have to provide discount passes to Denver residents. Um, 2023, we just broke the five point the five million um, trip uh, annual trip mark. 
Um, you can see in red here the old B cycle system that was in place since 2010. Um, you know, on its best year was getting about 300, 400,000 trips. We now can can do that on our best month um, with the shared micro mobility program um, that has just really grown off with the the e bikes and scooters. B cycle unfortunately was deemed to not be financially sustainable, and so having these private operators means that we can uh, scale the system much more quickly, and we're seeing um, just huge increase in the amount of uh, rides. And I think it's worth highlighting one of the reasons we really like this program is, you know, um, industry practice says that about a third of uh, shared micro mobility trips replace a car or a taxi trip. Um, and so we're, we're close to replacing nearly 2 million uh, driving trips um, every year now. And that's something that um, really matches our city goals around mode shift and sustainability. I mentioned the equity programs. Uh, there's kind of two components in our license agreements with Lyft and Lime. Um, the opportunity areas um, are disinvested uh, places in Denver that we um, want to make sure have access to shared micro mobility options. Um, so 30% of the fleets must be deployed in these areas. Um, Lime is also required to provide discounted rides for anyone who starts in these areas. And you know we're seeing about 20% of all trips are uh, starting or ending in these areas. It's also needs-based passes, so if you're income qualified, you can sign up for a Lyft community pass um, and get five cents per minute trips and, and similar with Lime. And we have about 3,500 active members um, at the end of last year. Um, talking a little bit about safe riders and safe sidewalks, I think those are the two areas where we hear um, the most concerns is the, the safety of the riders themselves and then um, for conflicts with pedestrians on sidewalks. Um, you know, as the program has grown and as we're seeing uh, more devices and more uptake, we definitely hear our stakeholder and community concerns around sidewalk riding um, and the same time that folks don't feel safe riding in the street. Um, and so building that infrastructure is definitely going to be part of the conversation today. Um, poorly parked scooters is a separate conversation that we've been having and how we can build out, um, you know, places where people can correctly park their devices at the end of their trip um, that aren't interfering with um, pedestrian or ADA access. Over the past couple of years, we've taken uh, kind of two approaches that I want to highlight. Um, the first was a, a digital approach where we tried to work with geofences to see how um, that could help with sidewalk riding compliance. Um, and then we've done a lot more with protected bike lanes in the past year or so um, and want to highlight that as well. So starting off with that kind of digital approach, um, as you know, all, all these devices have GPSs in them and we can set up um, geofences where, you know, in a certain geography, the um, it, the speed limit can be reduced, um, or we can have no ride zones where um, the motor itself will be cut off. Um, early in the project, we definitely heard from stakeholders um, in our in our most pedestrianized areas that um, we need to get these things off the sidewalks. Um, why don't you just geofence the sidewalks? Make it so the scooters don't work on the sidewalks. And um, I think we definitely had some skepticism around that, but we kept hearing it and we wanted to try it out and, and um, get some data either way. So we uh, took, uh, I did a little pilot on Lawrence Street in downtown Denver, where um, we put up a no ride geofence around the sidewalk. So we went on, went into our um, data provider ride report and drew the geofence along the sidewalk. Um, and then we went out with a bunch of uh, test riders, um, shut down the street for a little bit and um, had folks ride in three areas. Our test riders rode first in the travel lane on the, on the street, second in the parking protected bike lane, and third, um, they would go and ride on the sidewalk where that geofence was in place. And then we had them record um, if and when their motor cut off um, in, in, as part of the no ride geofence. And we have about 850 data points. You can see in the, um, this screenshot here, uh, we had folks um, who were riding in the, in the travel lane here, um, kind of where that white car would be. We had folks riding um, in the bike lane and then on the sidewalk, and they all recorded um, where their um, scooter was cut off, if at all. As some of you might expect, if you have experience with um, GPS on, on shared bikes and scooters, the findings were consistently inconsistent. Um, all our test riders were surprised at how inconsistent it was with sudden stops or late stops or no stops at all. Um, the folks who were riding on the sidewalk where there was the geofence were only stopped, that should say 18% of the time. Um, so it really only worked less than 20% of the time. Um, actually, it produced opposite outcomes um, than the intended and created ex extra safety concerns because folks who were riding in the bike lane or folks who were riding the street, their motors were getting cut off. Um, and that created an unsafe situation where you're, you're traveling roughly closer to vehicle speed and then all of a sudden your electric motor cuts off and you're stranded 
in the street. So um, this may be not be a surprise to some folks, but um, you know, geofences are great tools um, for things like educations and for large events, um, but they're definitely not a solution for sidewalk riding. The technology is just not there yet and it's not precise enough. Um, I think uh, there's a little bit of talk about sidewalk riding detection um, in DC. Um, and I think that's a definitely a different technology that's using more um, camera-based technology than it is uh, GPS technology. So um, excited to see the results from DC on that. Okay, so if that didn't work, um, we really have been looking more at protected bike lanes now. How can we do the infrastructure approach instead of the digital approach? Um, create those safe places to ride so that we can reduce sidewalk riding. Um, both Portland and DC and ourselves have uh, Ride Report as our kind of data um, aggregator and provider and visualizer. And that's been a really important tool um, in communicating internally with our um, internal stakeholders as well as external. We have really great data and understanding where people are riding, where they're coming from, um, what the volumes are. And so we've been using that to help um, justify and prioritize protected bike lane projects. So this is a, a ride shed visualization that Ride Report help us um, helped us make where we have one um, potential street in downtown Denver that um, we were thinking about adding a protected bike lane on and we were able to use the data from the shared micro mobility program to see that ride shed where everyone is coming from and although the average trip length is pretty short we definitely see people coming from all over the city to this one street and how adding a protected bike lane here could um, impact so many different trips. So using that approach and using that data um, to understand how many people are, are riding. Um, I wanna highlight one project here, Blake Street and Market Street Multimodal Projects. Um, I have a little video here, let's see if it um, starts going. Um, but essentially they're uh, two one-way, uh, it's a couplet streets, so they're both one way. Um, we had a lot of sidewalk riding um, anecdotally happening here. It's right uh, in the heart of downtown by the uh, baseball stadium. Um, and so we had plans for a bike protected bike lane on that street at some time in the future, but we were able to use the ride report and the scooter data to um, justify accelerating that project and bringing it up um, quicker um, to get that sidewalk riding down. Um, we used a quick build approach where we went with some Zikla um, white kind of uh, turtles there that you can see on that after image. Um, and just from the, the photos alone, I hope it's um, clear that it just creates such a, a more inviting um, scooting and biking environment that you're more tempted to do that um, than ride on the sidewalk. So this project also included bus lanes um, and we actually had some spots where we didn't have great sidewalks. So we have some pedestrian ways. Um, it was just installed last year and we're um, coming up on a year where we're going to be putting out a full report on the impacts of that, how it impacted sidewalk riding, um, how it impacted overall um, trips to see if it induced extra additional bike trips. Um, we're not quite there yet. That report should be done soon. And I encourage you all to check out our website later in the summer to, to see that full report. We also do some education, signage, communication um, work as well. We have uh, sidewalk decals that say don't ride on the sidewalk in some of our most pedestrian uh, heavy areas. Um, we have some education videos that um, not only tell you um, safe scooting practices, um, but also uh, where how to, how to be a good parker and park in the correct location. And we also see some of the biggest ridership um, in uh, in and around our sports stadiums during special events or sport games. Um, so we have the Nuggets, the Rockies, um, the Avalanche and the Broncos. We partnered with all of them to um, do communication to, to folks attending. Um, we did some videos with a couple of the mascots there in that bottom image. You can see the, the Nuggets mascot covering his head at, at the site of poorly parked scooters. And some of those videos actually play on the, the jumbotrons as people are coming in um, to remind them to, to park uh, correctly. Um, we also partner, I didn't add the bullet point here, but we also partner um, with our operators who do a lot of community engagement. They do tabling. Um, Lyft has a, a really cool little minivan where they serve lemonade out of it and Lime does all their tabling and stuff too, where they engage the community and, and talk about safe scooting practices as well. Okay, last thing I wanted to, to chat with you all today was about parking. Um, we don't have a lock to system, right? Everything is dockless. Um, but we do provide ample, or we're trying to provide ample corrals, parking corrals for people to play, give people a place to park um, so they won't block sidewalks, won't impede ADA access and reduce conflicts with pedestrians, um, keep our sidewalks clear and our streets organized. We have operator corrals, which is kind of what you see in that first image in the top left. 
And then we have city branded corrals, which is what you see in the top right. Um, we're trying all different kinds of things where um, we leverage Lyft and Lime to use their resources to build these corrals. And then as part of our city program, we're building them out as well. We're trying with, we're experimenting with a bunch of different um, placements and designs. So we originally were starting with a lot of above curb sidewalk level uh, painted boxes. Um, and now we're definitely moving a lot more to below curb um, places and um, particularly inside, inside our protected bike lanes. You can kind of see that on the top right image where in the daylighting area um, of a protected bike lane, a parking protected bike lane in particular, where um, there is no parking as you approach the intersection, that's some great extra space where um, we've cited a lot of um, bike parking and, and uh, shared micromobility parking, and we're seeing great success there. Um, people don't have to leave the bike lane. They can um, pick up a scooter inside the, the infrastructure, take their trip, and then drop it off um, inside the bike lane, inside the protection as well, and they never have to take it onto the sidewalk. And so that um, is really um, discouraging folks from riding on the sidewalk and parking on the, on the sidewalk as well. Um, we're doing a, a, a gaps analysis as we speak. Um, doing some kind of machine learning that's way over my head to understand where the demand for additional corrals is gonna be and how we can prioritize those um, as we build them out into the future. And um, recently, one of our two operators, Lyft, got a grant from our economic development organization as part of their downtown revitalization expert uh, uh, exploits um, to paint a bunch of our corrals. They are partnering with a local artist um, to create these dynamic portals, they're called, and you can see one of them painted there in those bottom images. Um, really creating a vibrant space and um, turning what is just a, a box into a, a more exciting place downtown. One last thing I wanted to highlight, um, this is a, a very anecdotal slide, but um, I think it does show some interesting um, takeaways and it's been very helpful with um, storytelling with, with stakeholders. Um, you can kind of see a before and after on the image on the left, we have summer 2022. We didn't have any parking infrastructure. We didn't have any corrals there. Um, and you can see there was about 2,600 trip ends um, in this intersection in that blue circle. Um, over, the, over the year, we installed a corral and then that same period, uh, June, July, August for 2023, while we saw a net increase in um, number of trip ends in that same area, um, we're now seeing 44% of scooters uh, being parked within that corral. Um, so the, the corral itself is sucking in those misplaced um, devices and keeping our sidewalks clear. That's not to say that the other 66% of uh, devices are misparked. Um, they can certainly be parked in a, in a respectful and, and uh, proper manner, um, but we are seeing that the corrals provide that space for people to park. This is one example. I don't want to say that um, it's, there's too much scientific rigor behind this. Um, there's a lot of GPS drift, but it has been a useful tool in um, storytelling our, our plans around corrals. So what's next for um, Denver and kind of the larger um, bike conversation? Um, we're having a conversation internally now about um, what do we call all these shared micromobility devices? How do we communicate them? Maybe bike is kind of an outdated term and we're kind of landing on the bike plus terminology where um, we can add a lot of plus signs to our infrastructure and not have to go and add new signs everywhere. But bike plus includes things like scooters and one wheels um, as part of our network. Um, we're building and, and upgrading that network and creating that protection so that people have the safe places to ride. Um, not only are we uh, building new bicycle infrastructure, but we're upgrading the existing, which is, I think is really important. Um, adding um, protected protection to um, bike lanes that previously didn't have protection, um, upgrading uh, kind of paint and post infrastructure to concrete infrastructure, and then really coming in and doing spot improvements on some of those most difficult intersections that um, where, the, where the most safety concerns are. As I mentioned before, we're also doing a big build out of our parking corral and getting that density to a place, a density of corrals to the place where it's more convenient to park a, a scooter in a designated corral than it is to leave it on the sidewalk. So that's it for me. I really appreciate your time and attention today. I'm happy to, to join the other folks and answer your questions now. Um, appreciate your time and attention. Thanks. Perfect. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nathan. I'd like to invite the rest of the panelists to come on to camera and uh, we can go ahead and jump right into our Q&A period. Um, I, I really do think you guys did a great job at addressing a breadth of different components when it comes to e-scooters and micromobility. Uh, one sort of common theme we saw within the Q&A was regarding helmet usage. So we had a specific question, what are y'all seeing in terms of helmet usage with e-scooter use in your city? 
Um, how does your city sort of encourage the use of helmets when riding? And then um, if you've had success in doing so, what are those effective strategies that you've been able to identify? Um, I'll, I'll take a first stab because I don't have too much to say here. Um, we definitely see very, very low um, helmet usage. Um, as was mentioned earlier, these are more opportunistic trips where you're not perhaps planning to take it. So you're not bringing a helmet with you. Um, and so it's very difficult to um, plan ahead that way. Um, you know, there's a handful of folks out there and I definitely see them more often with private devices where people own the scooter and they're bringing their helmets. Um, but you know, helmet usage is, is very low. Um, we work with our operators to distribute some helmets, but it's not a requirement. Um, I think we're really focused on creating the, the safe infrastructure um, as a starting place where you can take that oppor opportunistic trip and, and not um, need a helmet and still be safe. Yeah, similar to Nathan, like, or uh, we follow Oregon Vehicle Code that states that helmets are required um, for people using these devices. But yeah, it's hard to plan for a micro mobility trip, like during the midway through your day, to carry a helmet around all day. Um, but we do require the companies to have a plan to distribute helmets, a certain minimum number of helmets to their um, equity, when they sign up, when users sign up for their equity programs. Yeah, similar uh, to, to Portland there. Um, you know, they're the education plans of, of an individual operator. Um, we, would, we would ask them about uh, helmet distribution um, and we would require that they, they update us on a monthly basis um, on how many events they've attended, how many helmets they've given away, that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, at any point in time, um, any customer, any user of the system um, can reach out directly to the, the company and, and they can receive a helmet. Um, I think that typically they would get it for free um, as part of that. Awesome, I, I definitely appreciate those answers. Um, I think building on sort of the video that Nathan showed regarding the Quick Build project to create a space for um, e-scooters and micro-mobility users, one of the popular questions that we had had to or pertain to addressing sidewalk riding and um, how y'all in your specific cities are, are going about doing that. Nathan, if you wanted to build on that in any way in the video that you shared, and then I'd also love to hear uh, from Brian and, and Ted to see what Portland and DDOT are doing to address the same issue. Yeah, we're trying to build more and more protected infrastructure and we're trying to do it in places where people are already um, biking and scooting. Um, having the data from the shared micro mobility companies and um, being able to access that in real time and really uh, fine grain data has been super helpful in um, justifying creating this protected infrastructure. We have a lot of lines on maps, but um, when it comes down to, to implementation, it's extra helpful to um, have that data to back it up to say, you know, this hundreds of people are using this today and that's just shared micro mobility plus the addition of um, people on their, their own private bikes as well. Um, we're also finding that the protected infrastructure is a, you know, a vision zero strategy because it's narrowing the street, it's reducing the vehicle speeds, um, and so it's just creating a more pedestrian friendly environment overall. I think yeah, I, uh, you go, you go ahead, Ted. <laughs> um, as I, yeah, as I, as I alluded to, you know, we're we're working on. Um, we're going to wait through a rulemaking that would require sidewalk riding detection. Um, and in conjunction with that, we would allow um, scooters to, to go 15 miles per hour in roadways. Um, so part of that would be actually like a real time behavioral adjustment. Um, the scooter would also, you know, start barking at you if you if you do go on the sidewalk. Um, so really heavily discouraging that. And then we do have areas of the city where sidewalk riding is uh, illegal. Um, so the, the scooter would actually be cut um, to a much slower speed in those areas as well. So um, we're really looking forward to seeing, um, to, to launching that and, and hopefully seeing some success with that. We don't intend that, we, we don't anticipate that that's gonna be a, you know, one, one stop solution the second it gets turned on, right? Part of the process is, you know, really looking at the actual technology that they're offering, making sure that we're demoing it and then we're, collecting data on it um, and looking back and seeing where it's successful, um, you know, really tracking the 
the duration of the ride where people decided to go onto the sidewalk because to Nathan's point with that data, you can determine where, where are the missing links, right? Like where do people feel like they have to be on the sidewalk? And to an extent you do have to be on the sidewalk at some point in your ride, if you want to end the ride, um, unless you're parking in an on-street corral, you typically have to have to, um, to mount the sidewalk where, you know, we want to encourage people to get to hop off the sidewalk in, in DDOT uh, with, we partnered with, um, uh, a research institution um, a little ways back to, to see what the impact of like um, stencils in our central business district had on getting people off um, bikes so, or sorry, getting people um, off of their sidewalks when they're on the, well, you know what I mean. I think in addition to protected bike lanes, we were talking about in the chat, the neighborhood greenways, which are run parallel to our commercial corridors in Portland and just having the users be aware of that and having the companies promote that. I find like that information, like from, from a bike riding perspective, I find more often than not bike share riders know where the neighborhood greenways are because they're more used to this infrastructure, but the scooter riders are not as aware and probably ride on the actual commercial corridor itself. And so like just like publicizing this information and like whether it's in app, like like um like lighting up the heat map with like a neighborhood greenway designation on your in the in-app features is a is something we've explored as well. Um but yeah, just like thinking about promoting the neighborhood greenways in addition to protected bike lanes. I, that that just made me think of one more thing is you know, we do see a lot of tourists as I, I think. DC and Portland see um, as well, and they're not as familiar with the bike network. Um, and so, you know, in downtown, when we have the most ridership, we have a lot of one-way streets and the network is a little more confusing um, for folks. And so I think prioritizing simplicity of the network in places where we have the highest um, scooter ridership is gonna be important to um, getting people to, to use the network as opposed to just riding on the sidewalk. So that's something that we're definitely thinking about is how can we make the, the, the bicycle network as simple as possible for folks who aren't familiar with the city. Gotcha. I, I appreciate that. And then um, pivoting, you, you all spoke a, a lot about how data impacts your ability to do the job and to, to find um, strong countermeasures. So we, we had a few questions and I, I'm going to do my best to summarize the, the gist of what we had going on. Um, but typical, uh, I guess, process of obtaining data for y'all? Is it is it done in-house or do y'all contract with people? Um, and then specifically, how, how do you go about obtaining uh, crash data on, on e-scooter and other, other forms of micromobility? Um, in addition, have you had any uh, success stories about finding funding or any guidance on finding funding for, or funding for data acquisition when it comes to e-scooters? Uh, I could take a stab at that one and um, remind me if I'm if I'm missing any uh, any parts of the question. Um, as far as obtaining crash data, um, you know, our if it's a reported crash, um, that data is is uh, maintained and and stored um, by the police department. Um, but uh, I think I mentioned briefly we have a you know our Vision Zero office we have a data analyst over there. Um, who is able to clean that data and, and put it into a dashboard that's that's available to the public. Um, I'm happy to, to provide the link to that um, at some point, but um, there, there are a lot of issues with that data when it comes to categor categorization that I think we all sort of touched on. Um, so, you know, looking for ways to improve that um, is, is sort of um, a interagency effort. Um, we also have... Um, I think part of the second part of the question was um, was about funding. Um, we for like um, for safety campaigns was that it? Uh, so the the specific question is: Do you have any suggestions for um, obtaining funding for safety data collection as a part of implementing micro mobility programs? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I I don't have any specific, but um, I think the we we have a um, Part of our, I think most states have an office of highway safety um, that's funded through FHWA. I may be mistaken on that, but um, they provide a lot of our safety um, education and they are actually housed in uh, 
they're they're part of the Vision Zero team as well, so they're they're a valuable partner for us. Um, they put out a lot of our safety campaigns, um, specifically geared um, to drivers um, and keeping you know micro mobility um, users safe. Um, and as far as data acquisition is concerned, um, that can be um, you know a heavy lift when it comes to to um, to finding a, a partner for data acquisition and, and um, data aggregating. Um, if you're, if you do go through an RFP process, um, I think everybody's, everybody knows sort of the, <laughs> the cycle of RFP processes can be, um, can be a challenge for, for the district. We um, have been working with Ride Report. They've been a really great partner with us. Um, we've been able to maintain um, that contract just through um, basically our, our ongoing um, operations funding. Um, so we're, we're lucky in, to that extent, but, um, they're, they're a great partner for, for research projects. Yeah. Like Ted in DC and I think Nathan, Nathan mentioned, yeah, always use Red Report as their data aggregator. Um, and it's definitely benefited each of our programs. I feel, um, as far as crash data, it's kind of hard and there's like limitations to that. It's always difficult to track as well as when for, and there's a backlog in the data as well within Oregon. And for in Oregon, like the crash data, it's only reported when a scooter like is involved in a vehicle crash. And so like a lot of scooter injuries or major injuries are self-inflicted um and user inflicted so it's kind of an undercount there as and for a time there we partnered with the county um health to monitor um hospitals um reported injuries um and hospital visits but due to um staff limitations and the changing with the pandemic like that kind of like hindered our research and our progress and we might be looking um into partnering again with County Health and then your future about that. And yeah, I think that's all I had. I'll pass it to Nathan. Yeah, I, I unfortunately don't have that much to, to add. We get um, sources from our, our police department, um, from, from Denver Health, um, the County Health provider and um, from the operators too. And it's hard to know, you know, what's being counted there. It's hard to put that all together to, to form a, a full picture and just the you know, we know it's an underreported um, amount that, that plenty of people are, are getting into to crashes and um, not reporting them. So it's a really incomplete picture and it's something that we um, definitely struggle with. Got it. I, I appreciate the insights. Um, I think right now, zoom out a little bit. I, I think the purpose of this webinar is to uh, look at positive examples of, of you know, e-scooter infrastructure, micro mobility infrastructure um, across the country. But one of the questions that came through are, what are those examples for y'all when it comes to um, developing your plans or, or making um, any adjustments to your to your e-scooter programs in, in your cities? Um, I think what we're really focused on right now is um, keeping the sidewalks clear by providing um, places for people to park. Um, you know, initially we, um, had as part of our license agreements that the the operators would be building out a lot of the corrals themselves so we have some lift corrals we have some lime corrals and we're learning that the you know the public doesn't really care that if it's a lift corral or a lime corral that they just want to know where to park and so going back through and rethinking how we um, put corrals out there where we place them are they above curb are they below curb what is the signage that goes with them how do we make it super easy for someone to to park there and then um, where are we putting them and what convenient locations? So I think the a lot of our evolution, or we've been th our thinking has been evolving when it comes to, to parking corrals. Uh, I mentioned it before, but um, using the coupling parking infrastructure with the safe riding infrastructure has been a really um, strong thing that we've been doing more now where we carve out extra space through a protected bike lane, um, parking protected bike lane, and we find that extra space and that's where the corrals go so that you never have to leave um, the protected infrastructure when you're you're riding and parking. I think our main focus is like shifting right now, like from pilot to permanence and like this behavioral change that will happen with scooters and 
from going from dockless to lock to and trying to make it as easy as possible for the user and for the user to be aware um, while also like Lyft will be who operates our bike sharing program will operate our scooter program so like opening access to our bike share users to scooters and like that shift as well and like that partnership relationship uh, as we move forward in Portland. Yeah, um, I would echo both of those sentiments. Um, I think one of the biggest um, things that you know we were we're faced with and are tasked with is improving parking. Like Nathan said, um, it's it's a big challenge to accessibility, um, perceptions of clutter. Um, you know, as a new as a newer mode, you know, it, it takes a little while to to solve a lot of these um, these kind of nagging concerns and issues. Um, really, yeah, really providing, um, both, both, uh, density and different typologies of parking and then, um, sharing that sort of language with, with riders, um, to both incentivize and, and kind of gamify the parking system, I think is, um, is one way that I see this industry sort of continuing to, to improve. Um, and then of course, yeah, protected infrastructure, um, you know, just the, the amount of people that were, that were able to move on these devices is, is pretty impressive. Um, and these are all trips that could be taken by cars or ride share. So we're reducing congestion, reducing the MT mileage. So, you know, continuing to look, look at how we like kind of analyze those things too, and get better information on, on, um, what the actual impact is, um, on the ground. Um, you know, this, these, a lot of these, um, Know, policies are easy to to think about um, in a um, from the context of uh, you know sitting behind a computer screen, but getting out and seeing how it really is impacting um, the the community is important. Gotcha. I I appreciate that. And in that same line, I think I want to go to a couple questions we had about accessibility um, and accessibility within micro mobility. Uh, so I know that Ted, you answered one of the questions relating to um, the ways in which um, there, there could be opportunities for e-scooters and micromobility to positively impact um, wheelchair users. I was wondering if maybe the city of Denver and Portland wanted to extend on that sort of line of thinking. And then going on, on there were also um, inquiries about examples of whether or not there are any requirements that you are aware of for e-scooters to make some sort of noise or, or audible output um, for, for people who um, have low or no vision when it comes to micromobility in the space. Um, yeah, I think, you know, first off, we want to create those good places for people to park so that they're not um, parking, blocking the blocking the sidewalk. Um, I think for, we have a kind of a pedestrian mall downtown, we have a, you know, some campuses and the like, and really focusing on that's the places where our geofences can be a little bit more successful. Um, we don't have any audible requirements, but we do have slow zones um, in, in certain places where the scooter speed um, is, max speed is reduced to around eight miles an hour um, in, in those areas as a way to discourage people from, from riding there. And if they are going slower and, and at a more pedestrianized speed. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have there. Yeah, Portland, I think with the lot two requirement, we're hoping that that creates more order in like the furnishing zone and the pedestrian zone, um, as well as we do have slow ride zones in certain um, pedestrian, high pedestrian areas as well. And we actually even lower that from eight. Instead of eight, we have like, I think five miles an hour um, to really limit like the scooter speed. Um, and then we're also requiring, similar to uh, Seattle, like on all the devices, like have Braille, so like that they can report th to three one one on their devices. Um, if someone comes upon a scooter, that they can report it to three one one as well. Um. Sorry, one more thought. We have a public reporting where if there's a scooter um, particularly egregiously parked that a member of the public can report it and it'll go to the operators to, re to resolve. Um, we used to have in that form, there used to be a requirement for a photo um, 
to be placed there, but we've heard from some of our low vision community that, um, you know, they can't always get a great photo of, of the device, but they, they know it's there and they can report the location using their, their screen reader on their phone. And so we've dropped that requirement as a way to make it easier for folks to report about uh, missed park scooters. Sorry, I thought I was unmuted there. Um, I would just add in DC, we have um, a requirement that all devices have to have a bell. Um, I think that that is the is that audible component. I'm sure that's the same uh, in, in Denver and Portland. And you know, bicycle law does say you know if you're overtaking somebody, you have to have something on your device or or have or be able to um, uh, make some sort of noise with your mouth um, to to signal that you're passing them. I know that people often. Um, have the experience of being passed on the sidewalk when they least expect it. You know, you exit a building and a scooter wishes by and it's very frustrating um, and it's very dangerous. Um, so it's, it's, it's a sidewalk riding thing. Um, but, and then I guess also to the point of, of accessibility, um, there, there is definitely room within this industry for, for adaptive devices as well. Um, we have a carve out in our regulations that, you know, allow for a company to propose an adaptive uh, device um, that that is accessible to, to people with different types of, of physical disabilities, and it wouldn't it would not contribute to um, their fleet cap the way it's, it's written in our in our regulations. Um, some there are some challenges to that. Just a lot of operators hesitate to to um, to have that as an available um, resource. Um, we also our capital bike share system is also um, in the process of. Um, creating an adaptive device pilot program. So very similar um, process to the shared fleet device program. You'd be able to reserve a device ahead of time, um, use it throughout the day uh, and then return it just like any, any dockless system. Awesome, yeah, no, that, that's super helpful. I think um, continuing in this, in this direction, uh, Brian, we had a specific question for you regarding the lock two system. Um, the, the participant asked specifically about the lock two system and how it works. Will the floating locking mechanisms be disabled? Um, then so that locking to something would be the only way to actually end the ride. Um, I think it, that's the hope, but then we have to test out the devices like from the scooter companies themselves. Um, the, the companies also have, um, end of trip photos. Um, that are required if they don't have, it's one or the other, it seems like. One company has a requirement for end of trip photos and the other one has like what you just mentioned, Sandro, is like the trip wouldn't end until the lock is in place. So there's both. All right. Um, and then we'll, we'll move on to like a, an equity related question. Um, during the presentation, many of you mentioned equitable access to e-scooters and how you're addressing it um, through community engagement. We received a few questions from the participants wanting to know more about the strategies for addressing equity, particularly around getting e-scooters to areas that may not have as many mobility options, um, representing different social, socioeconomic statuses. Do you have any strategies that you may not have mentioned or are thinking about implementing that you uh, didn't have a chance to talk to uh, within your, your presentations? Uh, for DC, um, we have a um, minimum requirement, uh, a minimum deployment requirement um, that's based on um, the geographic um, areas of, of the district. Um, the The idea is that there's that operators are required to be deploying uh, a certain amount of devices in in areas where um, where there might be lower ridership, um, and that lower ridership is typically a result of um, you know, lower density areas, which are commonly um, uh, more auto oriented um, and oftentimes uh, lower income areas. Um, so that's that's sort of the the deployment um, approach that we have. Um, the The program itself, um, anyone, uh, any user can apply if they're um, at or below 200% of the federal poverty guidelines and they receive you know, heavily discounted monthly passes for, for unlimited uh, 30 minute rides within the district. Um, and as I mentioned, this past year was the first time that we um, brought a 
equity-based incentive into our program structure for operators. So we had previously, we had the requirements that the program be in place. We just didn't really have a mechanism for, um, for getting operators to get on, to, to do the, the legwork of, of signing people up. So um, with that, uh, the percentage of miles that are traveled by, um, by low-income customers, um, you, you receive a certain percentage based on that overall percentage, you receive uh, a discount for, for your permit fees. Um, we found a lot of success in there with uh, a couple of our operators having upwards of, of um, 10 and 10% of their trips uh, taken on taken by low income customers, which um, we're very, very happy about. Yeah, we've locked in a, a low income equity program um, rate in our license agreement with both of our operators. So we have that, you know, uh, rate for that program um, established and it is, it is slowly just, um, or not slowly, it is taking off. And, you know, I have operators saying that, you know, like a third to half their trips are being taken through the equity program. And it's um, something they're really concerned about, but it's something that we're really excited about um, as well, that um, folks who f folks can take advantage of this affordable transportation option um, we have deployment requirements in in certain parts of the city that have been underinvested in. So um, between those things, I think we're we're pretty happy with um, the amount of folks who are able to take advantage of them. Uh, yeah, with with Portland for deployments, uh, it's changing from the percentage of your fleet to neighborhood coverage zones. So like the minimum number, so there would be scooters in every neighborhood in Portland, uh, a minimum amount. Um, with like the data that I mentioned earlier, two scooters per thousand residents um, is how we calculated the minimums um, in each zone. And as far as equ equity, it's just like reemphasizing, like thinking about technological access, like the sign up process, um, as and like the turnaround time to get approval for uh, being an equitable user, as well as the looking at the technological and financial access components of your program and are you catering to or thinking about unbanked users or non-smartphone users and how they access the system that's really critical to um, looking at with a strong equity lens perfect um well i'd just like to to start off by saying um we are about out of time uh, but we really appreciate y'all joining us like ted said earlier to to create a space where research and um practice can can be bridged within the micro mobility space. Um, that being said, uh, I want to give a special thank you to each of our panelists and thank you all for joining. Please keep an eye out for our follow up email that I discussed at the beginning of the webinar, um, archive our post webinar survey and then our professional development credit information. We hope to see you all on our next webinar and I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thank you.